Welcome everyone to SWOX's interview with Tron Black. Tron is the principal software developer at Medici Ventures. And today we're going to be chatting with him a little bit about his background, how he got into crypto, uh, and Raven and Ravencoin, uh, the asset which we're most recently enabling on SFOX and which we're excited to be welcoming to the platform. Uh, so Tron, I'm thank you for that too. joining us, man. <laughs> what was Thanks. that? I'm excited. I'm excited to have Ravencoin be on the SFOX platform. It's fantastic. So we appreciate that. We're excited too. All right, so let's jump right in. Uh, we were hoping you could give us and our audience a little bit of background just on who you are and how your career got started pre-crypto. Okay, sure. Uh, I'm, I'm a very tiny part of Ravencoin, but I'm happy to give whatever information you want. So uh, ask away. Awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, and so what you just said about kind of the the background of, of Ravencoin and its community will become important later. Uh, but to dive into you first, um, so you know you you had a career in in computer science um, before kind of crypto happened, as I understand it. Uh, but I'd love to know a little bit about how you came to fall down the uh, the Bitcoin rabbit hole, as, as you yeah. and others have described it. Yeah, no, it, it really is a phenomenon, and I hear it from other people, and it just adequately describes you know. Or, or, you know uh, vividly describes kind of what happened. So this was uh, early on, pretty early on, not, not as early as some others. Uh, so early, I would say early-ish, 2013. Uh, I think I probably saw it in, in relationship to an article uh, related to the Cyprus banks. So back in uh, 2013, uh, they basically slammed the, the doors to the banks, closed uh, the Cyprus banks, and they said, hey, we're going to take just some amount of money out of everybody's account and, and you know, just to kind of pay for this kind of shortfall or whatever. And people got upset and then other people went, wait a minute, the bank's holding my money and they're not giving it back. That's not how banking is supposed to work, right? Because that's most, how most of us view banks. Um, and, and so you kind of watch this happen where they're like, okay, well, I'll tell you what, we won't take it from the bottom part. We'll take it from more from the people that, you know, that have more money in the bank. And so they kept doing that, uh, kept raising that bar while people were rattling the, you know, the, the doors <laughs> and, and getting upset until they reached a threshold where, uh, they said, all right, you know, there's, there's few enough people rattling the doors because it's just rich Russian oligarchs that were getting a, a, a massive haircut on their money. Uh, but because of that, there was a, there was stories about Bitcoin and how you're holding it and things like that. So I think that's where, where I found it initially. Uh, then it was a matter of like, how is this possible? Uh, you know, and you st just start reading. At the time, this isn't true today, but at the time, uh, you're kind of scrambling for more information about it where you're like, I don't quite understand. You're looking for articles. There's a few videos that kind of explain it, you know, explainer videos and things like that. And there's a the white paper, of course, which is really well written. So, you know, going through those things, but then you're just like searching for more information about it. And, and so just that reading and kind of absorbing and trying to understand it and trying to understand how it works. And there's like multiple layers to that, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's a very layered kind of thing. Um, you know, and also understanding how it kind of all fits together, right? The, the, the reward system is incentivizing people that are checking the, the transaction. You know, there's a lot to it. And so it was just that reading and, and kind of not eating and not sleeping and trying to understand all of it uh, that, that, you know, kind of, kind of went through that same process that I hear from other people that, that run into it. So. And after you fell down the rabbit hole uh, and, you know, became a crypto convert, you decided that you yeah. had to find some way to become involved and contribute to this, right? Could you maybe talk Correct. about your, uh, your thought process there? Yeah. So uh, I've been an entrepreneur all my life. I got started early, early, early on in computers, like kind of pre-IBM PCs, not pre-IBM, but pre-IBM before they were doing computers, right? So this was like the early Tandy Radio Shack stuff, the, the early Atari 800s, the Apple II, that kind of thing. So, in that, so I was programming back then when I was, I don't know, 13 or something like that. Uh, and so anyway, fast forward, uh, entrepreneur most of my life, so running own companies. Uh, I did get an MBA uh, because I was just interested in business. I have a computer science degree already uh, and then kind of combining those two things. Uh, I think it did give me a different perspective maybe on it, uh, not both the technical, uh, the business degree gives me kind of a maybe a wider perspective uh, on things and then uh, I would say the most important though was the entrepreneur perspective which is when there's a problem uh, it's it's actually a solution to someone else's problem, which is like a market opportunity. And so my brain works like that. I just, anytime I see a big problem, it's like, can technology solve this? 
And if so, has somebody already done it? Most of the time, I'll look it up. You know, Google's awesome. You look it up, you go, oh, somebody's already done it, right? And, uh, and other times, you're like, nobody solved this yet. This is a, this is a business. Uh, and so that's kind of how my brain works. And so I was like, all right, this thing is fairly new. Not everybody knows about it yet. Uh, what opportunities are there? And so what is, what's different about this? What does it change? And uh, in that process of thinking about that, I said, all right, it inverts the trust model. So uh, with, with Visa and MasterCard, you, you basically give them your private key, your number, right? You know, say, please take this much. Uh, you know, please take $39.95 and no more. Uh, which is, you know, seems crazy in a way, uh, but that's how it works. Uh, and I, I was also in the credit card space uh, in the sense that I was doing e-commerce from uh, 90, about 92 to about 2000. Um, sold a company and they wanted me to do e-commerce for them. Uh, so I've been doing that. So I was kind of in, in that payment space. So I said, all right, this inverts the trust model. So when you send someone the credit card number, if something goes wrong, you don't get your package, it's easy. You call a Visa and say, I didn't get it. They reverse the charges and they, they make the merchant prove that they shipped it or that you signed something, et cetera. It doesn't exist in crypto. So you give them, you, know, you send out you know, a tenth of a Bitcoin and then you kind of expect your package, nothing arrives. Uh, there's no Visa to call uh, and no Bitcoin headquarters to call. There's no way to charge. Uh, so you don't get the package. You just like, hey, I get my package. If they go, oh yeah, sorry, didn't arrive. You like stuff. So I said one of the things that's going to be needed is a um, uh, sort of a we'll call it VeriSign meets uh, Yelp reviews or meets eBay reviews. So uh, really, what you need is a review, but you also don't want that sock puppeted, right? So you, you want a review that says, hey, every time somebody sends crypto to this, they get their hot sauce or their pack of socks or whatever. Uh, but you also need to make sure that they can't create multiple accounts and just kind of rip people off serially by sending two and skipping one, sending two, skipping one. So you need to have like a, we know who this person is. Uh, so that was the, that was my first first foray into it. It was called Verified Wallet. I had a logo made. I started the, started the software, started writing software to basically verify people. Uh, it, ironically, it looks a lot like uh, the KYC information that's being done by uh, and, and we actually we actually had levels. So the first level was, was like, uh, send us your email. We send you an email back with a number. And you type in that number or you click a link and we know you have that email. And then send, and send it your phone number and we'll text you a number that you enter in. And then it, then it went up to the address. We'll mail you a letter with the number in it. You type that number in. It went up. We had nine levels. And so each level would be like a different level of verification with the last one being like super high, like, You've gone in and you know a notary. You've signed something with a notary present with cameras on you. Like we know who you are, and that way, once you had this level, right, you you could say, all right, I've got this. Now I want to build a reputation with this address that I've verified to a certain level. And that way, as long as you keep delivering, right, they send Bitcoin to it. You send hot sauce. You go, oh, the greatest hot sauce ever. It shipped quickly. Blah blah. And you start building reputation. So that that was the first idea. It got kind of derailed, kind of in the middle of the process, uh, we were in the process of building it. Uh, we, I, <laughs> was in the process of building it as a one man, as a one man operation. <laughs> um, and uh, so we, uh, we found that there was another group that was like, oh, all addresses need to have ad, you know, information attached to it. And this was uh, some, I don't remember the names, uh, but basically the crypto community at the time, which is different than the crypto community now, uh, very, uh, we'll call it, it's got a wider group of, of uh, people with different mentalities that exist today. Back then, most, surprisingly, were, were um, kind of a libertarian and, and it's had a certain uh, ethos, a certain bent. But those people went nuts. Those people, meaning myself included, I include myself in that group, uh, except I was building something specifically to solve a problem for merchants to build trust. And this other group was kind of like, oh, all people's addresses need to be known. A little bit like the KYC kind of thing is going on now when you may be in the STO space. Anyway, the crypto community goes nuts and says, we can't do this. You know, the whole purpose of these, you know, these unique addresses are supposed to be uh, you know, like anonymous, right? You're not supposed to know who you know, should not reuse addresses, et cetera. Um, so I realized quickly that, that my ability to get that message out uh, the cost of that just went way up. And so my ability to say, oh, no, this is different. This is to prove your identity so you can build a reputation. 
uh, was going to get muddled with the message of like, yeah, you need to attach an identity to an address. And that got very expensive. So I decided to do something else, which was solve another problem I was having at the time, which is I was experimenting with crypto all over the place, right? So it was like, oh, I did a little bit of Coinbase, a little bit in a mining pool, and a little bit in, in Mount, Mount Gox, and a little bit in addresses. And so it was kind of getting out of control, and I didn't even know where it was at that point. So I'm like, I need something to track this, a tracker. So I said, oh, I'll track it, figure out how much it's worth, et cetera. So I built uh, something called CoinCPA. Uh, which is tracking, basically tracking where my crypto was, but making it so that people could log in, see where their crypto was, and things like that. So, so I did uh, launch that, uh, and it was out there. Uh, ended up selling that. Uh, I got in trouble for using the term CPA, which is apparently like a thing you're not supposed to use, like unless you're an actual CPA. Even though we had an actual CPA on uh, helping us, uh, apparently that was a thing. So I ended up going to like pseudo court and and uh, you know getting in trouble for that, and paying a fine. Um, went from there, actually kind of the end of that was actually moving over to, uh, to T0, which had, uh, I heard Patrick Byrne, uh, in 20, either late 2014, early 2015, uh, talking about, uh, I think it was late 2014 in Amsterdam. I was helping another crypto company consulting and he was talking about doing uh, a parallel crypto equity to Overstock. And I said, oh my gosh, this, this overstock and they're, they're like 10 minutes from my house. And so basically it took me a little while because uh, they were still putting together a team, et cetera, but I uh, got on board like with, with the employee of T0 uh, and ended up doing all kinds of cool projects with them. Uh, first bond issuance on crypto, we built it on, it was on open assets. Uh, and we did that with Bank of New York. So basically a big loan. Um, and so uh, we did that and, um, and then worked on kind of design of, of, uh, trading platform and how that would work and things like that. And I then left there in kind of, the, I think it was the end of, end of 2015, uh, worked for ANX International. They do credit cards. They're out of Europe, uh, out of Hong Kong. I worked with them for eight months and then came back to Overstock. And uh, when I came back, uh, T0 was part of Medici Ventures. So Medici Ventures uh, is a venture firm. Uh, great place to work for anybody who's into blockchain. Uh, it's fantastic. Uh, very much kind of the crypto ethos. And uh, invested in, uh, I think, roughly 20 uh, crypto companies uh, in six pillars. So capital markets, uh, land, uh, uh, land titling, voting, uh, kind of crypto plumbing, uh, different, different, you know, so six verticals that were kind of like six, six uh, pillars that we were investing in. Uh, so we still have those investments and some of them are housed here, meaning in, in the Peace Coliseum. Uh, and, and so developers, myself included, get to kind of help with those companies. Uh, and then there's dedicated developers to various different companies. And then some of the companies are completely on their own. We just have a small investment in them. Um, so that's what Medici Ventures is. Uh, yeah, I probably went way too long. Anyway, no, that's, that's kind of... I, I love it. That's a comprehensive <laughs> look at who John Black is and what he's done. Thank you. That, that's amazing. And I do want to. I want to dive much more into you know the stuff you're working on now. But before that, yeah. you alluded to a number of really interesting things uh, as you were talking. One being just the degree to which the crypto and blockchain space has changed since you first discovered yeah. it in 2013. Yep. Right? It's changed yep. a lot. So I yeah. want to just ask you and invite you to talk about some of the most interesting or prominent ways in which you've noticed it changing uh, and what, if anything, you think that says about the space since you first discovered it up through today as we enter kind of the next decade of Bitcoin and crypto. Yeah, so, so the first, I went to the first, uh, not the first Bitcoin conference, but a, an early Bitcoin conference in 2013. Uh, and I had been playing with it, you know, thinking of ideas. This was, I had a verified wallet on my mind, uh, was what I was working on. I went to the one in San Jose, which apparently was one, an early one that was like two or three times larger than kind of what they, they expected. Uh, and I went in there and, and I had been like, cause I'd been doing software and all stuff before, uh, and sold companies and whatnot. And, and so I had done Comdex and Comdex is just this massive thing. It's a little bit like CES is now, or you know, only slightly smaller than CES is now. 
Uh, and so I kind of expected something like that, right? Like this big, big conference with lots and lots of vendors. And I, and I walked in and it was basically the size of like a high school lunchroom with these two by six tables with people standing in front of these tables, you know, little, it's like, you know, stuff they printed out or whatever the, the tables. And it's, it's uh, Coinbase uh, and, and Brian standing there in front of this table, you know, chatted with him for a bit. And, and, then, and then I walked around the room and then looked at the signs and said, I have an account there, 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 there. And I had an account or had interacted with 80% of basically the vendors that were in this, in this, uh, that we're here. I said, this is a lot smaller than I thought it was going to be. This may be earlier than, than I expected because I was feeling late, right? Because, you know, I had seen that, you know, Bitcoin had gone from pennies to $30 and a dollar. And, you know, I think it was in the $50 range or something like that at the time, somewhere in that range. And, uh, Anyway, so it was, it was just, and it, and it was the same people that were involved now. I mean, it was the Eric Voorhees, and there was the ASICs were just starting to come online, and, and, and uh, uh, some of these companies are gone. Some of them are still around, uh, but it was, it was pretty early. Um, uh, and at the time, and, and what reminds me of it is how has it changed? Uh, so there was a comedian, and he was, he was going to tell a joke, and it was sort of a it was kind of about just kind of sort of a Bush, uh, George Bush bashing joke about you know something about uh, like CIA intelligence, Bush CIA intelligence, something like that. And he's like, "How many Democrats do we have in the audience?" You know, of course, being in San Jose, you expect you know, a bunch of hands and but nothing, I mean, just crickets. It's like, "How many Republicans do we have?" You know, thinking this must be a GOP con convention or something, right? <laughs> and so, and then like one clap or something. Somebody's like, "Libertarian." And it was almost everybody. And it was interesting because it was like, it's not like you can't be invited without being libertarian, but it was like almost self-selected to be mostly libertarian thinking people. And I think that's changed now, right? So now I think it's people from you know, all walks of life and, and from, you know, from the financial industry and from, you know, from the, you know, both coasts, et cetera. So, I think the, the makeup has changed and it's probably more reflective of the entire US or the entire world, really. Um, but at the time, at this conference, it was libertarian minded people, uh, which was interesting uh, and, and it's kind of self selected. So for me, I'm like, my people, I, you know, I was where I belonged. And because and, I, I just had that mindset, this sort of freedom mindset. Uh, over time, I think it changed uh, just because more people brought in from kind of all over the place. Uh, and then the other thing that changed was there was uh, kind of a, we'll call it a, I call it a civil war uh, that kind of happened uh, kind of through maybe 2015, 16, 17, uh, that still has, we'll call it still has remnants uh, that are left over of, of either hard feelings or maximalists or whatever. Um, I kind of watched that happen in real time. I watched where it started. I watched kind of why it happened, which was mostly censorship, uh, which I'm very against. And so I kind of watched it develop over time and, uh, and then kind of it didn't end, I don't think it ended, but it kind of, what ended up happening is that, you know, the, the resolution was basically a split, right? Between Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash. Uh, now there's another split between Bitcoin Cash and Bitcoin SV. Uh, but I kind of watched that happen. Um, and I thought about it a lot, you know, what caused it, why it happened, how do we prevent it from happening again? in other tokens, other coins, things like that. So I think about that a lot. Uh, my belief, uh, and of course you'll probably get different, ask 10 different people, you may get 10 different answers. My belief, it was censorship uh, that kind of started it. It really was Gavin kind of saying, hey, we're gonna have this scaling problem. He was right at, at this point. And so they, they he and Mike Hearn created a, a solution for that and, and released it to the community. And then it was deemed uh, by censorship we're doing the censorship basically deemed as an altcoin and it kind of started there that was the genesis that was the seed and people who didn't agree that it was an altcoin because uh basically were kicked out right so they end up starting another chat channel and then it was like they didn't want to do censorship in that chat channel so like it was our btc it was our bitcoin our btc our btc was was almost unreadable because it wasn't there wasn't much censorship and our bitcoin was very kumbaya everybody agreed because anybody who didn't agree was booted and, and so this was a, anyway, that, this, that's the way I perceive the history of how this happened. It did uh, resolve with the, with the split. Um, and yeah, so, so that's, I think that's the big 
focus change. And now you, you still have, I'm going to just call it like feelings and remnants and stuff from all the stuff that happened, agreements, agreements that were broken, et cetera, along that chain. Um, I'm still a huge fan of Bitcoin. Uh, I'm not anti Bitcoin cash. Uh, so I, you know, like friends with all, and they, they all feel like uh, experiments uh, that are happening. I think it's great uh, that, that there's all these experiments that are happening and, and the market gets to choose uh, what wins. Well put. And so there, there, there is quite a storied history as, as you have shown already in crypto, right? And it, it, which is amazing if you think back to like 10 years ago when it was really just Bitcoin and now there's yeah. not even just Bitcoin Cash and Bitcoin SV, but every altcoin you can think of. Yeah, there's thousands of them. I know, it, it's yeah. insane. But so as, as you think forward to say, you know, the short term, the medium term and the long term over the next decade, given everything that's yeah. in crypto so far, what do you expect yeah. to be, you know, either the things that happen next or kind of the core issues that the communities will have to confront if censorship was one of the main themes that you've seen so far, sure. we're going to be grappling with over the next decade in crypto and blockchain? Yeah. So I'll take the short term first, uh, just sort of the, the one year. Um, I think, uh, I think we're, it's going to be interesting with Bitcoin uh, entering into the happening uh, this year, uh, somewhere in the May timeframe. Uh, I think that's going to be interesting. It's, it'll be kind of the first time, at least for Bitcoin, where the where the uh, call it inflation rate uh, will drop below the U.S. kind of uh, targeted inflation rate of two percent, right? So it'll drop below that. So until then, uh, and even when I started, where where it's like you know, inflation rate is, was very very high during this, you know, during basically during the last number of years, and now it's going to drop below. So basically it becomes more scarce. So people who are basically just economic miners that are basically mining, have to pay up their equipment, have to pay for electricity, et cetera. Uh, they, will, uh, they won't have as much to sell into the market. So that's the supply side of the, you know, the demand, supply demand curve. Uh, so that should uh, decrease supply. Uh, if the demand stays the same, price will likely rise. Um, this is all speculation. Uh, what's interesting is, is uh, is I've been able to watch other coins that, that went through extraordinarily fast cycles, right? There was one that basically did their happening uh, every month, right? So it was just like, okay, half this, this month, and half as much, half as much, half as much, uh, and, and watching kind of the effects of that. So we've got like, uh, they're not Bitcoin, right? And they don't have as much market, but you can kind of see what happens. Um, and so we can kind of watch all these things, you know, like play out before Bitcoin gets there. Um, and so the, it was interesting as the supply uh, diminished, right? The, the price went up. They did get into a, an issue where there wasn't as much, uh, uh, there wasn't enough issuance to kind of keep the, the actual security, which Bitcoin may or may not run into in the, in the future. Um, that's probably the best argument for allowing uh, fees to rise is to, to be able to incentivize the miners in the future when you know there's only one sat per block, right? You know, one, 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 one hundred millionth of a Bitcoin per block solved, right? So Bitcoin's either going to be enormously expensive, uh, or or there's not going to be enough incentive unless the, the fees are there. So that that that's a decent argument. Um, so anyway, for for the next year, I think the I think that's going to be the most interesting thing. I think uh, as there's a whole bunch of projects, uh, kind of VC things and hedge funds and crypto funds and stuff that hits the market. So like uh, other ones that are coming online that are a lot like a very sober second market and the GPTC, where you can buy those uh, on, for example, I can buy that through a Schwab account, uh, you know, in an IRA. You can, you can buy basically an entity that's holding Bitcoin. Uh, so I think there'll be more of those available, which will allow people to get exposure through uh, through uh, their uh, 401ks and things like that. So I think that's going to be really interesting to kind of bring that in. Institutional money, uh, I think if there's uh, uh, you know, uh, schools, family offices, things like that, that, that are able to invest in it. There's just so much money kind of sitting on the sidelines that once those are, once those are easier, right? And I think you guys are probably part of that, right? You can allow those flows from institutional money into the, into the exchanges. I think that, that's going to change things quite a bit. Um, as far as uh, kind of the we'll call it the medium term, the, the five-year uh, outlook, I think I think it's going to continue uh, with more institutional money, more uh, more 
tools, more DeFi, things like that. I've been impressed. Uh, I don't think the, the knowledge of them is very equally distributed, but there are options currently today, like Celsius, and Celsius and BlockFi and things like that, where you can uh, you can t basically take and and uh, deposit it and get interest. And when the interest rates for you know for a savings account are sub one percent, then you can make you know five six percent. Uh, it, it makes sense. Um, so I think that's kind of the medium choices. There'll be more of those. Uh, as far as what it looks like long term, long ten years, twenty years, I don't know. Uh, that, that's harder for me to project. Uh, I think um, I do think there'll be tons of cryptocurrencies. I think uh, so. One thing I compare it to is we used to have like three news sources, right? There was, uh, you know, like or three TV news sources, right? There was NBC, ABC, CBS, right? And you could pick you know, any of those three. And now uh, it's completely decentralized, meaning the even the news sources, you know, even the TV news sources are basically reading Twitter feeds of people who are on site at the fire or the whatever, you know, the event. Uh, and I think uh, crypto will look like that. There, there, will, there, is no, there is no limit or cap on how many different cryptocurrencies there can be. So you could have one that just your family uses if you wanted to, right? And, and I think it's a lot like news and blogs and things like that. It's like you can have a blog, you can just start it up, and you can be a news source, source for whatever the company you're in, things like that. And so there could be an infinite number, and there'll be some that are bigger. Well, you know, Bitcoin, of course, would, would fall in, into that category, and Ethereum, et cetera. Uh, but there can be tiny ones that, that can still trade against those. Um, so yeah, that's kind of how I think it will play out. I don't think there's, I don't think there's going to be a consolidation to like one. I just, I think it's more like, um, I think it's more like news sources. And what's a news source today is, is somebody with a a phone standing at the, you know, standing at the, at the actual event. And I think it's going to be a little bit like that. Got it. Got it. Uh, well, so I, I do really want to get into Ravencoin, but one final question uh, for the general audience, Tron, you know, as you mentioned, when you were first getting into crypto and Bitcoin, it was kind of hard to chase down information about it. And now of course there's no dearth of information about yep. any, uh, like even the teeny tiniest facet of crypto or yep. blockchain technology. Right. Yep. So if you are either an individual or a company or an institution trying to just get oriented in crypto and blockchain as we enter the second decade of it, what would you yep. recommend in terms of strategy for learning about it, especially when, uh, at least from my personal experience now, it can be so hard to separate the wheat from the chaff in terms of yep. what's information versus what's misinformation. Yep, I've been asked uh, about this quite a bit, so I have, I have an answer. Uh, so for uh, technical, I would start with Mastering Bitcoin by Andreas Antonopoulos. Uh, just it covers kind of the technical, it's mostly Bitcoin. I think he's also doing one Mastering Ethereum, uh, but, but that's kind of for the technical side. For the, uh, what does this mean for the world? Uh, also, Andreas Antonopoulos, uh, he has uh, other books, I'm trying to, uh, what is it, um, the Internet of Money. I think he has Internet of Money, Volume 1, Volume 2, Volume 3, so I would recommend those. And they, they kind of uh, also kind of saying, hey, what, what is the impact of this uh, with analogies and things like that that help, you know, kind of give you a, a sense, uh, help uh, relate it to something that you're, you're already familiar with? Because it is kind of a weird deal. I mean, it's a, it's unlike, I mean, it just has this unique property. Um, you know, it'd be like trying to describe a computer to somebody, you know, in, in the 19, oh, 1900s or something like that. It's like, I, I don't get it. No, it has a screen. You can talk to anybody. You know, it'd be hard to describe. And so having analogies uh, to describe that, and, and Andreas does a great job. Uh, for market, uh, and why is Bitcoin worth more than, say, Litecoin, which is basically just a code copy? Right, with a couple of parameter changes. Why is Bitcoin worth so much more than Litecoin or why is Bitcoin worth more than Ravencoin, for example, which is also a copy of the code? Um, and I think for that, uh, Crypto Assets, The Innovator's Guide to Bitcoin and Beyond. So by Chris Berniski and Jack Tatar. So that one is a good one for uh, what, is, you know, why, why is Bitcoin worth anything? Right, because it doesn't look like a company. You know, it doesn't.
doesn't necessarily have uh, discounted cash flows and things like you might model for a company. And so they take and, and look at like the metrics of why Bitcoin is worth more and things like that. So anyway, crypto assets by Chris Peterson. So those uh, Mastering Bitcoin by Andreas Antonopoulos, Internet of Money, Volumes 1, 2, and 3 by, by uh, Andreas Antonopoulos, and uh, Crypto Assets uh, by Chris Berniski and Jack Tatar. Those would be the books I'd start with. And then after that, you, you're going to be in branches after that. So then you, then you look at like, okay, am I interested in going uh, down, you know, uh, pick your own rabbit hole, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Good advice. And, uh, and, I, I think it's also good advice and telling to be recommending books in the first place, even though, as you mentioned, everything is becoming increasingly more distributed, including. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So I think if you just start out in the, like try to pick something without having the framework to work with, I think you'll end up, it'll be like the, you know, the, the thing where they say, you know, like an elephant, right. Where you're like, Oh, it, you know, you, you get, you're only seeing a little piece in the trunk. Cause it'll lay, it'll look like different things without having that framework to look at a whole thing overall. And I think those books will help. Um, and then, and then after that, then you can go look at all the you know, drill in, drill down. Great advice. So with that, uh, I would love to pivot to Raven and Ravencoin uh, at this point. Okay. Sounds good to yeah. you. So I, I figured as good a place to start as any is with kind of the, what I would call the origin myth, because that's such a central part of <laughs> so many of these crypto sure. assets and blockchains, right? Like, uh, you know, Satoshi, this anonymous figure yep. created Bitcoin yep. and Charlie Lee, a very not anonymous figure created Litecoin for different reasons. Yep. So yeah. what created Raven and Ravencoin and why was it created? Yeah, so I love these stories. I mean, I love the fact that we don't really know who Satoshi is. Sorry, Craig. Um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, I, it's just amazing. I, I think it's, you know, I, I follow the stories and all the different people it could be and things like that. It's just, it's just an amazing thing. Uh, so Ravencoin, uh, the, we'll call it the, the branding, the kind of a, the general concept of, of saying, hey, we're going to take uh, the most kind of like uh, tested secure coin, Bitcoin, uh, and then uh, create the ability to, to make assets on top of that. Uh, that, that idea, uh, seed, uh, was uh, Bruce Fenton, and, and he announced it in like October uh, 2017, I think. Uh, and then he started with it, and then uh, some of the developers did work out very well initially. And so he, had, but somewhere in the middle, and, and I apologize, I don't have like a perfect written. Hopefully, someday I'll learn this stuff. This is actually before I got involved. Um, and so, but, but very shortly before I get involved. And then uh, he talked to Patrick Byrne uh, of, you know, CEO of Overstock, uh, founder of Overstock. And uh, Patrick said, we, we have some developers that, that might be able to help with that. Uh, and so between the kind of the Genesis seed and, and Patrick kind of volunteering some people from, from Medici, and then I heard about it. And because uh, like my passion is the, you know, like kind of pure cryptocurrency and things like that. So I said, I, uh, that's one thing I wanted to be involved in. And so I turned down some other, some other options within Medici and, and then kind of, kind of jumped right into that. So uh, that's kind of where I got involved. And then uh, we, we actually looked at uh, various options within, within that looking, we looked at, you know, forking Bitcoin Dash and uh, a master, uh, let's see, um, multi-chain. So we looked at those. We also looked at uh, uh, Counterparty, which built on top of, of, uh, of Bitcoin. We looked, we looked at a whole bunch of different things, but uh, it was decided that, that Bitcoin is kind of the most secure code base. And so we decided to start from that. Uh, and so we forked the code, not the chain, but the code of Bitcoin and, and began with that. And then some of those was just uh, tweaking parameters. Uh, so it's got a higher issue schedule. So there'll be 21 billion with a B instead of 21 F million with an M. Uh, so 1,000 X the issuance. And that's done by increasing uh, 100 X on the actual block reward. So 5,000 uh, is starting with instead of 50 and then speeding it up. So increasing the block speed from 10 minutes to one minute. Uh, which is well within the parameters uh, of, of what's uh, possible. And we looked at what's possible and then we, we increased the block size some. Uh, I think we're still, I think there's still room to move there if we needed it, but 
uh, we doubled it. So it's a, a two megabyte maximum block size. Um, and so we started with that. And so that actually launched um, on uh, about three months later on January 3rd of 2018. So it was on Bitcoin's ninth birthday. Uh, and that was on purpose and kind of one of our goals. Uh, not because it had to, but just because it was fun and kind of an homage to 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 Bitcoin and, and its roots. Uh, we actually, the Genesis block was actually a quote from the same the, the Times, uh, London Times, and we found a quote uh, that was discussing Bitcoin uh, in that uh, publication, the same publication that the Genesis block for Bitcoin started with on that day. Uh, so that's the that's the quote that's in there. So it's it, which was perfect and it kind of worked out amazingly. Um, of course, there's probably a lot more people talking about Bitcoin now than there was, you know, uh, yeah. but but we found that quote, and that, so that was amazing. So we started that up, and then, of course, it didn't have a market or anything like that, so then everybody was notified of, of you know, you could mine it, uh, and things like that. So it was the only way to get it. We didn't do any pre-mine. We didn't raise any funds for it. Um, the Medici Ventures uh, very generously has kind of allowed uh, various programmers that were pulled you know, from various, that we already had from various projects to, to work on it. it so we, we got in a room, uh, it was near Christmas, so it was sort of October to December, we're working on it in a room with, near the cafe here, which had Christmas music. So we have a little bit of PTSD from that uh, left over. Um, Christmas music, you know, eight, 10 hours a day. Uh, but we launched it and people started mining it and it's been running continuously now for over two years. Uh, but the goal uh, was not just to make uh, another Litecoin because that's really you know, kind of similar thing, right? Parameters, parameters to Bitcoin makes another Litecoin. Uh, and so the goal was to be able to create your own asset. Uh, I had worked with counterparty uh, code and things like that uh, and also multi-chain and different technologies that do the same thing uh, that add the ability to put assets into a UTXO blockchain. So that's what we, after we got it launched and working, that's what we started working towards. And uh, so we, we got that done. Uh, got some great programmers here. We hired uh, uh, some people that are like, like are working specifically kind of on, towards this goal. And we, we, uh, we launched that on November 5th of 2018. So not quite a year later. Um, by, by launched, I mean, uh, it is a, we'll call it an upgrade or a hard fork. There's really not much difference if you have to change consensus. Uh, and so all we can do is change the code and then we can suggest uh, to the community that, hey, this is better than what you're currently running because it has these features and then everybody has to upgrade. Uh, and by everybody, I mean the important ones are the economic actors. This would be the, uh, the, the uh, coin payments and the finance and Bittrex, et cetera, and then also the miners. Um, and so uh, if individuals don't upgrade, uh, then they can always upgrade later when they want to spend. They just have to use their same keys, jump on the software or whenever. Um, so we don't really have control over that. All we can do is suggest. And so we launched, uh, in this case, uh, yeah, um, we did a BIP9, which is a, a way of uh, kicking it over once people hit a certain, once the mind blocks hit a certain threshold of blocks. Um, and so that, that launched. Uh, we've also made a couple of other changes uh, that we needed to, uh, to the, uh, the uh, I guess it's the difficulty adjustment algorithm. That was one of our challenges. Uh, so we had used Bitcoins, which adjust every 2016 blocks. It looks back 2016 blocks and says, hey, is it, are these blocks taking, well, in Bitcoin's case, 10 minutes, in our case, one minute? If they're taking longer, then we need to make it uh, a little bit easier to mine. If it's taking shorter than a minute, then we need to make it a little harder to mine. Uh, but, but this look back. So what, what was happening is uh, people would jump on when it's profitable because the difficulty was easy, uh, which means that the blocks go really, really fast, right? Faster than a minute, and then it makes it lots harder. Well, then it's not as profitable as maybe some other coin they can use their GPU. And so then the difficulty is higher. So then people jump off mining and then it takes longer and then it makes it easier again. So we're getting this oscillation and it was getting bigger. And so we made an adjustment to that, to, the, uh, to use uh, Dart Gravity Well, uh, which is a, an algorithm that adjusts every block. So it adjusts the difficulty every block by just a little bit, but then sort of limits the thresholds to kind of prevent a, an actual attack kind of thing. So we made that change. Um, we made a change for, 
Oh, uh, ASICs. One of our, in our original paper, uh, we said, yeah, we prefer not to have ASICs. And it's not that we don't like custom hardware. Uh, it's not that ASICs are evil. It's that uh, the goal really is to have it be more like the people's coin, right? So that you have a gaming machine, you have a, 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 car, a video card in it, you flip it on at night, you get some Raven. Uh, we prefer to have that character more so than, oh yeah, this is mined by massive data farms that, you know, that are in places with cheap electricity that have bought custom machines. We just want it to be more like, oh yeah, no, I mean, th th that's kind of the, the goal. And so we did make a change to, to take ASICs off the network uh, and then also fix a couple of bugs at the time. Uh, we think there's some ASICs kind of coming back online now. So there's sort of a push to, to make another change. Um, and then, but our big change uh, that we've been working on for a year, and this is where most of the energy has gone for the, for the coding, uh, has been we're doing uh, messaging, which is the ability for a token issuer to uh, notify their token holders that hey, something's happening, we want to do a vote, or we want to switch tokens, or something like that. Um, and then the other, uh, the other change, uh, memos, which is the ability to include a message uh, with every transaction, one that goes on chain, or at least the hash of it goes on chain, the message actually goes in IPFS. Uh, and so that's, that's another change. Uh, and then because we, we're trying to make it so that we build a tool set for people to compliantly issue uh, tokens that, that kind of uh, follow the rules, I guess. Uh, uh, the, mostly US rules, but there's some other jurisdictions that have rules uh, related to securities. Uh, we added some, some code that allows, allows you to constrain tokens within a subset of addresses that you know who they are and things like that, which is part of the rules that, we need, that, that securities need to follow. Not me. Um, so those are the changes that are like actively can be activated now. We just need more miners to to mine those blocks, and we don't have control over that. All we can do is suggest, and we think it's in their best interest because we think this tool set is, you know, makes Raven coin more valuable, which means you know it should be in their best interest. But that's largely out of our control, other than to just say, hey, this is this is the code, and is why we think everybody should move to it. Right, right. Really helpful overview of, of what Ravencoin is. Um, Tron, I, I have more questions for you. I just want to check in with you about time because I know I still have oh, 25 minutes. I, I, I'm fine on time, especially if you can edit out, out the boring stuff, then and <laughs> take, take, take what you like and, and uh, so I'm fine on time. Yeah. Okay, we super appreciate that. Thank you. Um, so then I guess maybe the, the next place to go to, to zoom out for a second is, you know, as you said, you have a pretty impressive amount of experience working on different projects uh, that focus on asset creation and issuance, right? So what is it that excites you about that uh, so much and, and makes you want to dedicate so much work to that? Why do you think that asset creation and issuance is an important um, tool to give people in their toolkits? Yeah, sure. Let me start by saying I'm a huge fan of cryptocurrency just like in general, right? So Bitcoin, Litecoin, uh, I mean, just, you know, the, the tokens themselves, huge fan, right? So that, that's really my passion. The next phase of it, I think the part that, and there's tons of those, right? And if you want to make another one, you take Bitcoin, you copy, you give it a new name, you have another one, right? So that's great. Uh, not much work involved in that, right? If, if we need another coin, we can make another one. Uh, I think the next phase is using, uh, is tokenization of assets. Uh, and so that's really what Ravencoin is doing, to tokenizing assets. So, so you could tokenize a fraction of, let's say, artwork or a fraction of, uh, you, you could have a token represent a stable coin, for example, um, uh, which case you, you have you know, sort of a digital dollar. Uh, so that already exists on Ravencoin. That was the one that was launched on November 5th. So we have that currently. That's, it's active, it's working, people are tokenizing things. Uh, you know, there's 22,000 different token names that people have gotten. Most of those are, you know, to be honest, are probably speculation on the name because the name has to be unique. But we have we have people who actually tokenize things. We have a company, uh, there's a company out there, Equistart, that's doing uh, cap tables. So tokenizing, just keeping track of the the, the, the founder's uh, share of the company as uh, tokens. Um, and so, uh, so if you want to tokenize and get your company started right, kind of using this, uh, you, can, you can go there and they'll help with like startup documents and all that kind of stuff. And I think their goal is also is to make it so that you can digitally sign 
uh, so that all the founders digitally sign that they're adding a new member or new owner and things like that so that everybody kind of agrees and it's not just some spreadsheet that one guy is keeping track of and things like that. Um, so tokenizing art. The other one is uh, non-fungible tokens, which is uh, basically can be used for certificates, certificates of authenticity. So let's say some sort of artwork that could be copied. Uh, maybe it's prints of, of unique artwork or whatever. Uh, you want to make sure that those are uh, genuine. So you can create certificates of authenticity. Let's say there's only supposed to be 100 prints. They can create 100 unique tokens, and every token is expected to be held. The owner should have that token. And if they want to sell it, great. They can sell the token with the artwork, and that way you know it's genuine and authentic, et cetera. And the technology kind of behind Bitcoin is making sure that you know, there's no counterfeiting of the token and the token transfers, you know, are all, you know, kind of signed over and, and that, that you know, they can't be, uh, you know, counterfeited because that uh, technology, you know, that's behind Bitcoin does that extremely well because of that decentralized nature. Uh, so because of that, uh, you can also move to, uh, well, everybody's familiar with ICOs, right? So ICOs, this idea of ownership of part of a project or a company or, or something like that, a great idea uh, we just had there's there's laws uh, behind that and there's a reason for the laws and, and one of those reasons is if you if somebody has no intention of doing what they what they said they would do right you're buying into a project where they wrote a white paper and they have zero intention of, of following through and they walk away with the money and then you're like well wait a minute you said it's like yeah who cares because you know I'm not following the laws right so I think that's one part of the reason the laws exist uh, is just to prevent kind of fraud and people just like saying they're going to do this, collecting money from people and then running off. Um, ICOs, I think some of them, uh, great ideas. I wish they uh, had, uh, I have a unique position on this, it's not unique, but uh, I have my opinion on this. I think had we let that continue uh, and we went after fraud only, right? Where, where it's like, hey, you basically just took money and then you just ran off with it. There's always going to be people who take money, attempt to do what they said they're going to do, that just aren't competent, either competent managers, competent developers, competent you know, leaders uh, that are going to fail. Um, and so those, uh, we're going to fail anyway. Uh, there's some that were just fraud. Those should be prosecuted. Somebody should just go after and say, hey, you said you were going to do this. And you didn't even attempt it. You just walked away with the money. That's fraud. Um, that's more of an FTC thing. Um, and then, uh, and then there's other projects that I think would be would, would work great. Uh, you know, it's like they they were seasoned people that had done this. They write the white paper. They execute on what they were doing. And now you own a, a piece of this thing. It's, it would be like a share. Uh, it can even pay back dividends and things like that. Um, what didn't exist? The infrastructure that didn't exist is sort of the eBay ratings of, of, of these things. So you're kind of going blind and you're like, oh, this paper looks good. I don't know who these guys are, but let's give it a shot, right? Um, if there was some way, and there, there was uh, Smith and Crown and some of these things for the ICOs were trying to do this, uh, where they were trying to, to say, hey, they, you know, we've, we've met with these guys. These guys have done these projects before. Uh, I think if that piece was in place and the ratings and other people looking at it, I think, I think we could have gone sort of from ICOs to a very dynamic, uh, robust fundraising mechanism uh, that uh, would continue to work. Uh, the other thing that I think happened at the same time is because of uh, the laws that have been in place for so long is retail investors are kind of prevented from investing in these risky assets. And so they don't have the skill set to, to necessarily invest in these things. And so there's lots of fraud. I think if if we'd had this sort of system where people understand, oh, I got to like I got to do due diligence. I got to learn from somebody. That we could have gotten to the point where it's a little bit like eBay. You kind of look at it and you say, oh well, I'll get this a little cheaper. There's some chance of fraud because they don't have ratings. I'll, I'll invest ten dollars, right? And then it may work. And then that person starts building a rating, and 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 but they don't raise very much, right? Because people are very very cautious and they'll invest, you know, like an amount of a cup of coffee. That's possible under this, this tokenization model. So I, that's what I would have liked to have seen. But in the US, we have these laws. And so the ICO uh, thing was basically kind of ignoring all those laws. And some of those laws include 
uh, you know, you need to know who's holding the token. So KYC, AML, uh, you have to be a accredited investor or it has to be registered with the SEC, things like that, right? So uh, the tool set that we're, that we're building allows you to kind of follow these rules. It allows you to not send tokens or if you send a token, and let's say you collected the KYC information, you, you can be assured that that person can't send the token to someone else that isn't KYC, which comes back on, on the issuer. And, and so those, the tool set to allow the tokens to only move amongst uh, addresses that have been KYC is the tool set that we built and it's now just kind of coming online to mainnet. So anyway, that I think uh, we have basically the tool set for highly regulated environments and uh, the asset issuance under Ravencoin for non-highly regulated environments or environments where you don't have to collect that information. And perhaps this can be done in other countries and overseas, uh, might be just for tokenizing you know, art or a car, so, you know, one item, things like that, things that don't, uh, don't you know, hit the Howey test, uh, you know, uh, things like that. That all exists today on Ravencoin uh, for other jurisdictions. And so we've got a tool set now for both. Uh, and, and the restricted assets have a dollar sign. You start with the dollar sign at the front. And so you know that that's a restricted asset. And with a restricted asset, the issuer who issued it to you, and even if you sent it to someone else, he can freeze it in place, right? If he gets a, if he gets a, you know, a legal letter from the government that says, hey, this may be used in you know, nefarious purposes, you need to freeze this in place, uh, they can do that. Not only freeze it in place, but then also document in the on-chain why it was frozen and things like that. So th that tool set now exists. Very cool. What's one major misconception about Ravencoin that you've heard and would like to correct? Uh, yeah, so, so there's, uh, there's not very many detractors, uh, which has been, uh, which has been nice, right? The community's pretty, so far, this is like, not going to look great. Uh, it's been pretty friendly. Uh, if there are detractors, I would say, uh, the, I would say the misconception is that, uh, that the early people had some sort of like advantage, right? Like, like we took money or, or we pre-mined and things like that. And, and so there was none of that, uh, you know, it, it was announced on multiple Twitter accounts and things like that, but it, you know, we can't announce it to everybody, right? It was a new coin, um, but we, it was announced. Uh, so that, that's one. Uh, there are a few people out there that say, oh, this is a, that, that Raven is a security, right? RBN uh, is a security. And, and that just isn't the case either. And there's a, we have a legal document that kind of shows why it, it you know, analyzed how we inform and things like that. So, you know, people who kind of jump in maybe and don't understand the history or uh, don't understand that. So there's still a few people out there kind of thinking in that, in that regard. Um, uh, other misconception. Our, our biggest problem isn't misconception. Our biggest problem is we didn't collect money, so we don't have a marketing department. And so uh, when you have an EOS that raised potentially billions of dollars, and then uh, you have Raven, which didn't raise anything, it's pretty much all word of mouth and miners saying, oh, no, this is, this is a good project. Uh, and so you know, even this AMA, right, it is super helpful to Ravencoin because we don't have, uh, you know, we don't, we don't advertise or anything like that. But what we do have uh, that most other projects don't have is, is the community support. And, and so the people that have written explorers and uh, run the community, meaning discords and do uh, uh, moderation for discord and telegram and all of that stuff, we don't do any of that. It's like, we don't, I mean, we're, we're basically just developing and then, and then I kind of like, chat about stuff and maybe where we're going and things like that. But that's kind of it. We don't have a, yeah, we don't have a marketing part. So, but we have an amazing community that's doing a lot of that and it's actually getting the word out. That is amazing. Let me ask you, uh, for anyone who's watching and wants to get to know that community, is there any central place uh, to which you can point them that has like a roundup of all the different community resources that are out there? Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's not perfect, but uh, ravencoin.org and then click on uh, community. There's lots of links there. Um, 
part of what we're trying to do is not be the, we're literally trying not to be like a company or a central kind of thing. So, but you know, obviously you have to have somebody curate the code. You don't want, you know, uh, dangerous stuff getting the code. So we do protect, uh, protect rate in that, in that regard. Uh, but the uh, community page will link to lots of different communities. So um, just uh, pick some and find the biggest ones. Uh, there's a Discord one that's pretty big, has lots of channels, and a Raven community that's pretty big. Uh, that uh, for uh, yeah, Raven community on Discord, and then the Telegram channel is pretty active. Uh, so those those are probably be the two biggest. Um, there's also a mailing list that you can get on on Ravencoin, and that's um, we're working towards getting it so that other people can like add to it. Um, but right now, it's also curated in the sense that we don't want anybody to spam out anything to anybody. That's the you know, people who use a you know a big distribution list as a as a spam channel if we open it up too wide. But I'm um, trying to make some of the Anybody who's working on projects can basically announce their, you know, raving fund projects can announce through that. Yeah. So you talked a little bit about um, like the process of updating Raven and Ravencoin earlier, but you know, given these yeah. constraints that you're talking about and the efforts to make a truly decentralized project that doesn't have something like a Ravencoin foundation, right? Yep. How do you go about yep. issues of governance and and finding that uh, like kind of financial support and other just resource-based support for, for raising sure. or project yep. or foundations? Yeah, uh, so there is no foundation. Uh, I'm not against a foundation. If somebody wanted to put one together, uh, it would be a little bit like the Bitcoin Foundation. It's not like Satoshi said, hey, you know, uh, we need a foundation. You know, let's start one. I think, they, I think he was an honorary member, but um, I don't think he, you know, certainly he didn't set it up. Uh, anyone could do something like that, um, and, and I think uh, it would end up being a place uh, that, that just people could contact uh, to kind of, again, kind of fan out and do their own thing. I don't think it's going to be uh, funding anything, uh, but it could, right? So I guess I'm not against it, uh, but, but there, something like that doesn't exist right now. Uh, Medici Ventures is, is uh, so backing or paying the salary of developers that are working on, uh, myself included, uh, both on other portfolio companies, helping them, but also working on this. So, uh, so and, and it's, there's been some developers that are, uh, I think I'm the only one that maybe is in the, was in the original group. In fact, that's true for sure. I'm the only one kind of there from, from the beginning. Uh, so other people kind of spread out to various other portfolio companies and things like that. Yeah. And, and the nice part is, I'm just so everybody knows, I mean, if, if I got hit by a bus, Ravencoin doesn't blink, it just keeps moving on. Uh, it, it isn't, uh, it, it, it's just code. Um, and it's available on our GitHub, and it's free, and uh, people have forked it. I, you know, I'd say it could be forked, but you know, people have literally forked it and made other coins out of it. Um, I expect that to probably continue. Um, I hope that we make a better, you know, better decisions and make a, you know, a strong coin, strong community, but it, it really is kind of a, uh, by, by, it's not by dictate, it's more like by, I hope we do a better job than, than somebody else does. That's it. Yeah. That is an amazing kind of structure for a project to have. Um, I, I, I wonder, more specifically, what you think about marketing uh, these kinds of projects, because uh, what you've been saying reminds me of uh, something that Samson Mo told us when we interviewed him a while ago, because we were asking about kind of the, the plurality of projects out there and how to distinguish real serious crypto projects from potential frauds or scams. And he yeah. said something along the lines of anything with a marketing department, you have to immediately call into question. So do you think that uh, is it is it like a good thing or something important to the nature of a decentralized project like Ravencoin that it doesn't have a marketing budget? Or do you think that's just incidental and if someone were to throw marketing behind it, that would be excellent? It's, I would say, yeah, if someone throws marketing behind it, that's great. Uh, I, I don't think it hurts it. I mean, if, if it, marketing, marketing can also be a pump and dump, right? So, so one advantage we have 
is that it's sort of growing organically, right? It's not like we're out there hyping it up and then people go, oh yeah, no, I expected this and then it you know, kind of fails or whatever. It, it's sort of just growing, uh, growing organically. So there's a big advantage to that. So you will see a cycle and we even had a little bit in that. We don't have a marketing department, but when finance says, hey, we're, we're listing Ravencoin, that's exposure, right? And so we did have kind of this, this kind of big run up uh, when, when that happened it, but it was a great thing for the coin but it you know it exceeded you know expectations and dropped down some or whatever but then i expect that'll happen uh, you know multiple times you know i'm hoping at some point uh, i think coinbase is a good candidate uh and so i hope they add it at some point um and gemini and things like that um but uh yeah so i don't i don't necessarily see it as a as a, like a necessary necessarily a red flag um, but I think it's pros and cons. I mean, I would love to have, uh, you know, uh, EOS's budget of billions to basically let people know that Ravencoin exists, right? If, if for no other, no, nothing else than just come check it out and be able to tell the entire planet, come check it out, evaluate it on your, you know, on your own merits, even if it's not telling them anything about it, just come check it out. I would love to have that kind of, uh, ability just for, for people to come see it see what it's about and evaluate it for themselves. Uh, but at the same time, uh, it's been amazing to have like the community doing it and have it just grow organically and it's probably safer that way. Um, yeah. John, uh, thinking more about the specifics of RVN, the coin, right? So you yeah. were really helpful earlier, uh, I think, in explaining kind of the the supply and demand economics of the halvening for Bitcoin and yep. why that yep. was something that might affect the price, right? So just in yep. terms of helping our traders to understand this asset, right? You've talked about yep. the project Raven or, or Raven coin, right? As this yep. platform for asset issuance, right? Correct. If it's something for people to use to create and control their own assets, what role does the asset RVN play in that? And what are the dynamics? Sure. That's it. Sure. So, uh, so every, I'll, I'll use something that people can relate to, uh, just because everybody's familiar with it, um, and that is uh, Ethereum and uh, gas, right? Ethereum, gas, and and creating your own asset on the ERC twenty contract, which is just one contract. Uh, one one way to relate this is is you can think of assets as a better, easier to use, easier to understand. Uh, ERC-20 contract, right? But that's kind of all it does, right? There is no smart contract, so there's no programmability. Uh, we do have atomic swaps, so the ability to swap Raven for an asset or asset for an asset, where you construct a transaction, you sign it, send it to somebody else, they sign it, and it happens like, it either all happens or none happens, right? If they don't sign it, then submit it. Uh, so we have that, those capabilities. Raven can be used in that transaction. Uh, Raven is used uh, for the tokenomics, meaning uh, you have to burn 500 Raven uh, to, in order to create an asset. So that's burned, it's gone. Uh, it's an approvably, approvably burned address or you know, there's no private key for it. Um, so every asset, the 22, 23,000 that have been created so far, uh, that times 500 Raven is just gone. Uh, and uh, to to do a, um, uh, let's see, to do, to become a qualifier, I think it's a thousand Raven to, or uh, 1500 Raven to be, to get a restricted asset, it's uh, 1500 Raven, and those are burned. So nobody gets them, they're just no longer exist. Um, uh, so it also, uh, it's used for the fees, right? So it's not a free network to use. So if you, have a token that represents, let's say, a share of artwork or something like that, and you want to transfer it to somebody. It's a very small uh, fee, but it, it is used for fees so that the, so that the miners uh, get that fee. Um, um, so you can think of it like gas is to Ethereum ERC-20 contracts. So that's, that's what Raven's for. Uh, it can also be used uh, just for uh, value transfer, just like Bitcoin, just like Litecoin. So it has that same property. It's, it's had a value once it got on various exchanges. It's trading on uh, 30 some odd, some odd exchanges. Uh, its volume at times has exceeded that of 
uh, uh, you know, like on Windows on Bitrix, exceeded that of like the Ethereum BTC pair at times, right? Not not always, but it's it's had very high, high volumes. I think it averages somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, like, uh, 10, 10 million dollars uh, every twenty four hours ish uh, for that token. Um, so it's pretty good liquidity, uh, pretty good volume. Um, uh, there's lots of exchanges it's it's trading on. Uh, it's been built into multiple wallets, trust wallet, edge wallet, et cetera. So you can get lots of different wallets. So you're not kind of reliant on one. Um, uh, it's been built into uh, even a chat, like one that's based on signal called Mixin. So it's built into a wallet on that. Um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not, am I answering the correct question? Uh, oh, no, definitely. Yeah, that, that's okay. Been, All right. <laughs> Okay. I personally feel like I have a much better understanding of it than when you started talking. So that's, that's usually my, okay. for someone, <laughs> my question. <laughs> okay. Uh, so yeah, so it's useful for, if you want to create assets, transfer assets, you do need to have Raven. So it is used as part of the network. It's not just a you know, ancillary thing. It is used to protect uh, and also create. So, so when you create an asset, and this is also unique and different than ERC 20, uh, in ERC 20, you, 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 you give it a name, but you get back a contract ID and that contract ID is unique, but the name somebody else could reuse because the network isn't kind of aware of like kind of keeping track of like this contract is, is using the same name as this contract, you know? And, and uh, so that gives you some big advantages, especially if you're creating a token that, that you're going to use for branding, you can be assured that this token with this name is your token. And so you can kind of help brand that where it's a little bit, you, you could brand a contract ID, but it's basically 40 X characters. And so if somebody got one that was similar, I mean, it's, it's just difficult to brand. Um, the other thing that the advantage that it has over ERC 20 is when you create the, the, the asset, you create a pick a unique name, but you can also add the metadata. I mean, what is this token about? What is it for? What does it represent? Um, and that information goes in IPFS, which is interplanetary file system. You get back a, a IPFS content identifier and that goes on chain. These two work together super well. In fact, so well that we're kind of extending in this new release the, the connection between them. Because IPFS, you put a file in there, you back a unique identifier. That identifier will always be that file, always. Now, it's possible if nobody's interested in that file, including the person that created that file, that file could disappear. Um, but we have it right now, we currently have a swarm of Raspberry Pis that somebody in Ravenland is creating Raspberry Pis that basically scan through the chain, get the files out of IPFS, and then store them. So there's a swarm of people storing these files. So right now, if you created uh, the metadata about what your asset is, there's no way it could get lost because the swarm would pick it up and keep a copy, and then you always would know this asset means this. Uh, and those files can be PDFs, movies, text files. Uh, we have a spec that we kind of suggest. Uh, not everybody follow, follows it uh, because you can put anything you want in there. Um, reason we did a spec is we thought, well, if we had computers crawling it and kind of building a database of what it's for and who issued it and what, you know, what, what uh, you know, how to contact the person about this. Uh, so, so our spec is basically a JSON file that kind of points to other data. Um, and, and so a lot of people have followed it. So you could have a crawler go through all of those and build a database of, of tokens and what they're for, um, but not everybody follows it. Some, some people are putting in pictures and, and videos and movies and all kinds of things. Uh, but going back to the ERC20 thing, the advantage with this is your token, your name, guaranteed unique, and anybody without asking you or coming to your website, go to the site the FS database and see exactly what that token represents. Um, and that, that's been powerful. Because it's been so powerful, that's why we're moving to this messaging and memos. Messaging meaning you can also talk to your, as the issuer of a token, I can talk to my token holders. And then also the ability to put in when you transfer a token or a Raven, either one, uh, you could put a memo of what it was for. It could be an invoice, uh, it could be the reason, it could be the cost basis. I mean, any, you, want to put it, you can put in a movie with every transfer, right? We, we, don't, we don't decide, it's kind of like saying, hey, it's a file system, what are you going to store? Well, we don't, we don't dictate that. But, those are just some ideas of what you could store. And whatever you store, to go back to what you were talking about earlier, in terms of its utility, can be compliant with whatever regulations you want it to be subject to. Correct. We have, we have some, 
we have, uh, we'll call them just suggestions on how to, how to be compliant. So I wrote an article on how to do this. Now I'm not a lawyer, so I, you know, I like to say that a lot because uh, I don't want anybody to think that this is legal advice. Uh, so, but we do have a, there's an article, if you go to, again, ravencoin.org, uh, my medium is there and you can go and you can see a bunch of articles I've written about how to, you know, kind of why we built it and how and things like that. It does suggest in there that you get your own lawyer to kind of vet what I'm saying because I'm, I'm just, uh, I'm just a guy, right? You know, I don't have a law degree, but, um, you know, check it, check it and make sure that it works, uh, for you. And, and even in there, if it doesn't work for you, tell me why so we can improve it, right? And, and give people a pathway to being, le doing legally compliant, uh, security tokens. Um, you know, it's, a, it's a tool set to help you follow the rules. Yeah. Tron, there's something, uh, while we're on the, you know, uh, theme of explaining aspects of Ravencoin, uh, that I was hoping you could explain to me because I'm someone who's not very technical, right? Uh, my, you know, I'm interested in crypto, but my background's in philosophy. I'm not an engineer. And so one of the things that, uh, was kind of just interesting to me, uh, when I was researching Ravencoin was, you know, you already talked about, kind of the reasons why uh, Ravencoin in particular is uh, opposed to ASICs for that project, even though ASICs can be useful in other circumstances. Sure. And yep, so yep. It, it says in the materials about Ravencoin that uh, the developers are committed to changing the hashing uh, algorithms if ASICs are ever developed for Ravencoin, right? right. And so yep. again, as someone who's not very technical and kind of only understands on a conceptual level what a hashing algorithm is in the first place, I find yeah. myself wondering how that algorithm can be changed without disrupting the whole network in the process. So for people like me, okay. could you maybe walk me through? Yeah, sure. It, it does disrupt the network. Um, Perfect. It does. Yeah, ev everyone has to change uh, the code. Uh, no, yeah, so it is, it is disrupted. Um, so we don't, we don't like uh, changing it because it's, it's disruptive. Uh, it's, a balance between trying to keep the character of Raven, which, uh, and, and you can go read, you know, what people think of it and what, how it should be, but there's a lot of people that say, I like Raven because, and that because is, hey, I can mine it on a regular GPU. It's not dominated by, you know, a bunch of data centers. Uh, it's, it's something that's like approachable and, and I can set it up on my, on my machine at night and get some, uh, and, and so people like that. And, and it also brings back, brings people into the community, right? Where they, where they can just run a computer and then have some and then go, what is this? And I think Bitcoin for a time, and I think it's getting better, became less approachable. It was like people would ask questions and, and just if, if they were kind of like shot down right away, uh, and it probably varies by channel. I don't want to character. I mean, Bitcoin isn't a, but, but if the channels that the people were learning about Bitcoin weren't friendly, uh, then, uh, you know, people can get turned off on, uh, to crypto just in general. And I mean, there's other coins they can jump to and they have, and then there, there's other, uh, you know, friend, I'm sure there's friendly Bitcoin channel that will throw Bitcoin under the bus, but we definitely would like to keep the character of Raven as like kind of fun approachable learning, right? For people who didn't learn about Bitcoin when it was like this, this you know, small thing where you could get a little bit really cheap and play with it and give it to people. I mean, there was there's stories of, of, uh, of Mike Caldwell giving away you know, this, the Cassatius coins and he was able to get them down to about $2 and, and he would give those out to people, right? Well, you know, at some point those became worth $20,000 plus a premium because they're collectible and you can't, you know, but, but this idea that I can give you, you know, like just some Raven and I can mine some and things like that, it just brings people in and they learn about it. They learn about crypto. We're kind of, we're doing that. And we're also trying to build like a bulletproof platform for, for security. Token. So this is a little bit mixed, mixed message there of like trying to build a bulletproof issuance platform, but also make it super friendly. You can give it away to your friend. We're, we're kind of being all of those. We'll see where it kind of ends up, but. Right. No, that makes sense. And I, I can only imagine what a juggling act that is. Uh, I, I had a couple more questions to ask you sure. uh, just about the, the past and the future of Ravencoin, right? So first, yeah. as you look back over the history 
of Ravencoin and the project so far. Are there any like defining moments or turning points where, where you really think that Ravencoin defined itself uh, or just events that happened that had a big impact on how the coin has evolved from the Genesis block up to now? Yeah, there have been a couple. I would say the Genesis launch uh, was defining in the sense that we ended up getting uh, an actual quote from the, from the magazines. But the idea that we kind of were able to kind of follow almost that same model and kind of like uh, be similar to Bitcoin's early days, uh, that was a defining moment. Uh, we had a, a really interesting defining moment. I wrote it up. Uh, if you go to uh, my medium, which is medium.com slash at Tron Black and look up uh, there's an article, I think it's called Remember, Remember, the 5th of November. Uh, it was actually the, we tried to launch on uh, on October 31st, uh, which was kind of the birthday of the white paper. Uh, we tried to we tried to allow the, uh, the asset activation thing to happen on that day, or start activating on that day. And we had uh, some miners that weren't, uh, that weren't switching over. And it was like, it, we got like the entire mining community involved uh, because I was at a World CryptoCon and there was a mining show and some friends there that were, that were helping to put that together. And we needed to get past this 90% threshold that we had set. We would chosen that as our threshold and we weren't getting there. And it has to test the, how many blocks each cycle. And, and the whole community got involved and, and people were miners were calling other miners and bringing, bringing uh, GPUs online and people were renting hash power. And, and there was memes that were being written and should, I mean, it, it was this amazing thing. And, and I woke up finding out that we weren't passing this threshold. And so I walked down kind of oblivious you know, down to the show and somebody's like, do you know what's happening? And I have no idea what you're talking about. So they're explaining it to me and they were getting, Anyway, it was it was an amazing day. And then we get to the, the actual launch of the thing, and it's like counting yet. So so after it gets past this threshold, 2016 blocks have to go by, which for Bitcoin is two weeks. For us, because our blocks are faster, is 1.4 days. So we're waiting for this countdown, right? It's counting down to the second, and it's going to happen at roughly 6 a.m. And so I've got scripts to try and get the assets that we want to get. This would include uh, assets like Overstock and T0 and things like that. We're trying to get certain ones. And, and uh, so we've got those, and we have no, uh, we have no advantage over anyone else, right? Even though we've kind of, you know, written the code, we have no, no advantage. So all we can do is like have all the developers try to get it at the same time, and then the software is going to figure out who gets it. So we get down, this thing's counting down, and then it, and then it triggers. And I wrote a script so that I didn't have to get up at 6 a.m. Although I did, because it's a big event. So I get up, and I'm watching the script count down. And it triggers. And it's like, sorry, you know, some, some sort of error about dust. And it just repeats this error, error, error. And then the, the channels, the telegram, the discord light up. What is this dust thing? Why am I not getting my asset, right? And it's just, it's scrolling at a million miles per second and flying by and we're like, I don't know what this is. And so we're, I'm on the phone with, the, with the other developers. We're trying to sort it out. And we basically find that there's this, this code that's in there that's only on mainnet and not on testnet. We had tested this this process of activating on testnet over and over, like, it. and and on mainnet this code exists, you know, sort of if mainnet and not on testnet, so we didn't see it. And it's like, it, it basically was saying, hey, you can't send a zero Raven transaction. You had to have at least some amount. It was a legacy stuff left over from Bitcoin. And we had missed it. And then so anyway, we're now we're now going. Well, now what do we do? Do we launch this thing over? Do we start? How do we solve this? And, and we're trying to figure this out. We're talking about it like in this academic sense. It's like, what, well, I guess we could start. And then all of a sudden, one asset gets created called Vote. And we're like, uh-oh, somebody has the ability to create an asset, meaning they've recompiled the code, mined it themselves, something. And so sure enough, they had figured out what it was, taken the code, rebuilt it. They had a mining pool. They, 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 they issued it. It's like, uh-oh, whoever this is, is going to be able to like issue whatever prime assets that other everybody's trying to get. So it's like, all right, this is this is no longer academic. We need to find this. We found the developer, he's a great developer, friendly guy, awesome. So we chatted with him, figured out what the issue was, changed changed the code, uh, and started building binaries to get everybody out there. And, and and the big conundrum was like, we wanted our assets, but like, can't create them until other people are able to create them. 
And so we're like waiting, waiting, waiting. And then they all of a sudden they got created. And so we're like, okay, now we can do ours quick and get ours, but we don't get all the ones we wanted. And so uh, some of them we bought, some of them we, uh, you know, we feel like it's kind of being extorted or whatever. And so we haven't, um, but that was a, that was a super defining moment for, for the coin. Um, hopefully the next transition goes smoother than that one, um, which is kind of being activated now. Uh, right now is somewhat of a defining moment and then we have set an 85% threshold for this next activation for the new features. Uh, and we're at 75%. And we've contacted the miners that we know about, mining pools that we know about, we've said, hey, please upgrade, uh, but we need another 10%. Um, just shows we're not we're not in charge. Uh, all we can do is recommend. Uh, some of these mining pools maybe only speak Chinese, uh, and so we're not sure when it's going to activate. Uh, but we're in this process now, and we have, there's a website for how many how many you know what percentage and all that kind of stuff if people want to monitor it. But it's uh, it's it kind of another defining moment for us. Well, I was thinking exactly what you just said, which is what a testament to how really decentralized the network and the project is. That's, that's yep. what you're showing exactly that. Let me ask, uh, as you look forward beyond this, this current activation and waiting for that threshold and, and more to the future of Ravencoin, what do you think, yeah. on the one hand, are the biggest challenges that Ravencoin will face? And then on the other hand, what are you most excited about for the future of Ravencoin? Yeah, I would say... Uh, Biggest challenges are probably just awareness. Um, so I think that's increasing, uh, but I think because we don't have the marketing budget, that's where like all the good stuff that I talked about of being decentralized, the bad stuff is is awareness, right? So people, there's still within my world, and you know, I have this bubble, right, where everybody I know knows about Raven Point, but only because me or somebody I know told them about it, right? Or Patrick told them about it, you know, in Overstock or whatever. Uh, so my world, everybody knows about Ravenclaw. That isn't true of the world at large. So if I step outside of my bubble, I'm like, what? You haven't heard of Ravenclaw? What in the world? Um, <laughs> kind of thing. Uh, and there's a lot of people that don't know about it. So uh, just exposure of, of what it is, what it can do, what it's capable of. I feel like we're uh, a fair bit ahead of a lot of other projects uh, and I don't want to throw anybody under the bus but I, I feel like we have this feature set that's that kind of lets you do lots of amazing stuff right the use case list right if I was just and, and and I've written I mean if you go to again medium.com slash at there's use cases of what you could use this for you can use the IPFS thing you can go you can use all for all kinds of things right for asset tracking and supply chain and all kinds of things and we've written uh, project things to kind of show you how it's done but my exposure limit is, is this much, right? It's just what, what basically what you know, people are following or, you know, to, to Bruce or to myself or to Ravencoin or, or something like that is kind of the limit. Um, so uh, yeah, that, that's the, the next thing is, is just hopefully people seeing what it is and then more community and more people, more word of mouth, et cetera. Um, the next phase after that, I think, depends on how that first phase go. If the awareness hits, and you know, I will call it a critical mass or a tipping point, uh, then scalability is going to become an issue. Um, so uh, we, we can certainly increase block size, uh, you know, obviously with the community's permission, um, which I don't think will be a problem uh, if scaling is a real issue. Uh, you know, it, it isn't a fight that we're, we're, we're having. Um, and, and the other thing is, I mean, if we hit scaling issues that we can't solve because blockchains are not as fast as a centralized solution, uh, you know, it, it's not unreasonable to have uh, forks of Ravencoin that end up uh, for specific things, right? For specifically, maybe this is used for, uh, you know, for certificates of authenticity or for different different use cases. Uh, so that's a possibility. We're talking down the road. Right now, we have no scaling issues. We got plenty of space, plenty of room. Uh, you know, we've never run it. We've never, you know, hit any any limits or increase fees or anything like that. So there's lots of room currently, uh, but none of the blockchains, and this includes Bitcoin and Ethereum, etc., have the capacity to do like, you know, a Nasdaq level, uh, you know, uh, kind of kind of trading and things like that. So uh, that's something we can work on in the future. But you know, computers get faster um, and things like that. So. Some of it, some of it'll 
uh, be mitigated by just improved technology. Right. Well, you've gotten me excited for the future of Raven <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Tron, I think that's about all I have for you, but uh, do you have any final thoughts or, or things that you want to leave us with? Um, yeah, uh, so, so for anybody who's watching this, uh, at least check out Ravencoin. Just, just, just see what it's about. Um, I don't usually like to talk about you know, price and, and things like that. I, I basically like to show what it's capable of. Uh, and and uh, like we talked about earlier, the springboard for that is, is pretty much uh, ravencoin.org. And then there's just lots of channels. They're not really uh, in order. So it's not like, you know, click the top top one, it kind of spread out. And one of the reasons for that is, is we are trying not to be like, oh, we're favoring you over you kind of thing. So it's like uh, people can add themselves to the website. Uh, so that website, ravencoin.org, uh, you can, it's GitHub and you can, you can, it's under Raven Project. Uh, and you can go to the GitHub, you can pull it down, modify it and basically do a pull request with your community, your information. We'll look at it to make sure it's not like dominant cheating, you know, trying to push somebody else out or whatever. Uh, but if it looks reasonable, like you've been fair with you know, where you put yourself and what, then it gets added. We can add, you know, we click go and then show up on the website. So um, we literally are just making it like a, a, a place to get started with Radio Point and then, and then branch out. So that's what it does. Um, and, and you can add yourself to it. Um, it is very community driven. Uh, we can use all the help we can get. Uh, if you come and like it, uh, tell others about it, uh, build something on top of it. Uh, if, you, if you are an aspiring developer, uh, come build something. You can build, like you can contribute to the code, right? literally to the Raven core. Uh, if you're a mobile developer, you can contribute to the uh, mobile wallets. We have an Android, iOS. Uh, if you're a front-end developer, we have explorers that you can contribute to and make better with you know, assets and, and improve the, 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 that. Um, so there's a place for kind of everybody. Um, if you just want to write about it, great. I mean, join in. Uh, you can uh, DM me on Twitter or Zatron Black, uh, Telegram, I think I'm at Raventron. Uh, and uh, Discord, you can find me there. I don't remember what the handle is there. Um, and and uh, I can, can uh, one of the things I try to help do is connect the right people together. Um, or if you want to do issuance for a project, if you need legal help, I can kind of route you to uh, the correct people. So, yeah. Awesome. Well, Tron, thank you again so much for your time. I can't tell you how much I've enjoyed this, uh, and I'm sure that our audience will too. From all of us uh, at SFOX, Tron, we're just so excited to uh, be enabling RVN trading on SFOX, uh, and I personally can't wait to see uh, where the project goes. You've got me excited. Hey, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of SFOX. I know T0 is using SFOX. Uh, I'm happy to have, have Raven on there, so I appreciate you guys.